Because in this week, I want to talk to you about no woman, no try. How can I help and how can other male allies really help support the women's game? If you put your money where your mouth is, us as women will show you we are worthy, as we always do. Mic drop. This movie I actually found pretty interesting. I think it was a nice uh, look into women's rugby, really honest look. No Woman, No Try is a 2021 movie made by Victoria Rush. And it talks a lot about the issues that are happening with women in rugby and the events surrounding some of the movements that occurred. It focuses directly on the UK, uh, namely within the professional uh, Premier 15s. Uh, there's some other local ones, but ironically, they don't really they don't really talk that much about the smaller leagues. They they bring some people in to at least recognize they exist, but it didn't really talk that much about it. Uh, the two main people that they focused on in this movie were Shauna Brown, who is the now retired Shauna Brown, legend for England rugby, uh, of course, played for the Harlequins for a long time, and a multi-sport beast of an athlete. And as well as Steph Evans, who plays for the Bristol Bears, I actually have had interactions with Steph Evans. She wrote an article for Gift Time Rugby before. So to see her in this light was kind of cool because uh, I always knew that she was she was pretty um, pretty solid as a leader and was very outspoken of a person, but to learn so much more about what she's out here doing and what she'd been creating was really dope to be able to see. And, and it, this almost starts off, it starts off with a little bit of a speech by uh, Shauna Brown kind of talking about why people need to pay attention to women's rugby and it is absolutely one of the best and it's a shame. And I agree. I know from my experience watching women's rugby, especially at sevens, it's been one of the best rugbies. It, it's literally one of the best rugby to watch. And in my opinion, one of the reasons is that is just because it has the best athletes available playing in it. It's one of the few contact, team contact sports that women can play that have actual notoriety. But even in that, after that, one of the things that actually surprised me that I learned from this was that this after 2017, whenever uh, the RFU said that they're going to be professionalizing the women's uh, high performance game. So the Premier 15s uh, creation and 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 the uh, international sides. I thought everybody who played in Premier 15s actually was a professional in terms of they got paid to play. But this movie put it out where it was like, no, it's only like 20 something of us that are getting paid professionally. Shauna Brown included in that. And that blew my mind. Because it, it, it continues to make the struggle of elevating the game, especially in a place where, one, the RFU is one of the, if not the richest rugby union in the world. Take that for what it is. Number two, it typically is the one that is driving the direction of where rugby goes in, in, uh, in terms of innovation, good or bad. So this one was, was an interesting, unique look. Uh, the other thing that I took from this was uh, the impact of Steph Evans and uh, social media during 2020. And they looked a little bit into that where they talked about the uh, I Care movement, uh, Her Rugby Counts movement, uh, as well as the uh, I Am Enough movement. All of them were uh, women, women's rugby focused, creating more awareness, and a lot of that came... Uh, after the Six Nations women's got canceled and they had to just focus on playing in their Allianz Premier 15s league, which I thought was really interesting uh, to know because I'd seen them online, but you never really know anything about it. Uh, they This movie talked about uh, a few of the issues. They talked one big thing, obviously, uh, looking into the players uh they provide a little bit of insight into each of the players, uh, Steph and Shauna, to give a little bit of a background on them. I wish there had been a little bit more. I understand they wanted to create the aspect of the problems that exist in women's rugby. And obviously the source for uh, 
body insecurities that could happen that rugby helped alleviate for these women and, and the other women that were involved in this documentary. But I really wish we had gotten more personal, like even more vulnerable. And it, it's wild to say because they did talk about some, you know, things that were in their childhood. But I, I still kind of felt like they left something on the table, which would have put some additional weight into the significance that women's rugby plays and really how that speaks to the business element of, of how rugby goes. And this is what I mean. One example that they spoke on uh, was obviously how they talked a lot about the body, but they talked about the way that the men's team would just pass down their jerseys to the women's professional side, which is wild to me. Like from a professional stance, you want to make sure that you have unique, at least set merch for each of your sides. You don't want to just pass the jerseys from the men's and then going down to the women's because your fans that are for the women's side are going to be want like a slight variation to go. Like that's literally, we're just talking about more money. Now it's more money also being spent, but you're a professional side. So you already have a level of revenue that needs to be coming in, whether it's from ticket sales, sponsorships, whatever. But I was shocked that, you know, you had that. But what was even more shocking was the problem that came with shorts. And I didn't know that, and call me ignorant, but I did not know that uh, there needed to be different shorts for women and men. Uh, obviously, in clothing, there's different cuts, and I, I, I get that. But ignorantly, I just I didn't think about it for rugby because it's like, oh, it's short shorts. Boom. Everybody's short shorts, yada, yada, yada. And then your issue might be if you have thick thighs or something like that. But that's everybody's problem. But no. There was a legitimate problem with getting women's shorts. And Steph Evans actually commented on that in the movie talking about she spoke to the men's side uh, for Bristol, the Bristol Bears, and uh, asked them about them ordering separate women's shorts. And basically, they were like, no, we, we don't do this because it costs more. Like, this is a cost-saving mechanism. And so she was like, yo, okay, so if that's the case, why don't you get women's shorts for the men? And, of course, they laugh because that would be out of the norm and, and, and different. And so the entrepreneurial set of Steph Evans, who this is apparently well documented that, you know, her Canadian self is, is pretty forward thinking, created a company called Ruggettes, which still exists to this day. And they make supply women's shorts for women rugby players, which has to be a massive Massive population of people. I mean, at least three quarters uh, or at least half or maybe slightly less than half of all rugby players in the world are women's rugby players. So you're talking about a whole section of your playing population, once again, money, that are not getting adequate shorts and could use them specifically and you can build off of that. Like that... That kind of blows my mind. It's so obvious, but it's not. E even if it's a little bit more expensive, like, that's what marketing is for. And, again, I, I say this about professional outfits because they already should inherently have some level of a revenue source available to them. They're, they're charging people stuff. So even at that, like, you want to offset some of your costs by creating new revenue streams. That's, that's how you would want to get that done, especially if you could be an exclusive um, uh, at least a white label holder. Uh, another another character that I really loved in this uh, documentary was a woman by the name of Zanab uh, Alema, a.k.a. the Bulldozer. And she came in about 30 minutes into the documentary, and I loved her. One of the things that I loved the most about her was the fact that she is actively trying to be one of the first... Um, Islamic uh, women's rugby players for the England national team. And she's gotten great accreditation as a rugby player, as a prop. She was voted one of the best rugby players in 2019, 2020, 2019, 2020. Uh, she has shown proficiency and uh, to this point is still working to get 
to that level, but she's shown proficiency on the field. But I also love the fact that she was unapologetically her. She's a black woman. She was Islamic. She's married with children. And by all means, should not fit the mold of what would be the prototypical, in, especially in the UK, rugby player. And it was something that even as I was watching the, the documentary was like, I feel like as much as they're complaining about the issues, like this is coming from one cultural set. And people can say that maybe in Europe they don't act the same way as we do in the U.S. when it comes to racial divide. And I'm going to call BS on that, considering that's where it all kind of started from. But, like, it was it was a very, very um, one side, uh, white side of the rugby. And I thought that whenever they brought Zineb in, uh, it was something that kind of provided a refreshing view because she mentioned that she doesn't look like majority of the players that she is playing with. And that stands a lot to how you create the community and how that's accepted. And so to have all these check marks on there was great to have her energy and her genuine love for the game of rugby was so great to be able to see and, and witness. And I think it was something that needed to be talked about just as much. Uh, one last player that was talked about, and this one was Hugo Monye, uh, who was kind of the self-pronounced male ally for this women's side. And I, I don't think they use him very well. Uh, I mean, they really used him simply just to spit out the point of how do you support women's rugby, which they were very uh, direct on, which is tweet show where you to watch a game and celebrate the moments, which is very simple. I think that we can all agree with that, that that's pretty helpful when it comes to being able to promote and push and, 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 and elevate the women's game. But I really did feel like he kind of fell into this like robotic phase of being like, yo, this is the liberal handbook for how to uh, support. And, 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 and I get it to the extent that some people make it so overcomplicated on how to support or make it such a big deal about supporting women's rugby that you need to have somebody who is very direct. Hugo Monier is an accomplished rugby player in his own right. So it made sense to utilize him. I just wish there was more of his involvement as opposed to just talking about um, being a support. Uh, but again, to the direction of the documentary, it, it makes sense as to how they placed him. My final thoughts on this was, this was a solid one. I was a little concerned that they didn't speak about the LGBTQ uh, plus side, um, considering that is a huge uh, component of women's rugby, whether it's the, from the players or from the perspective side, and how that affected the way that they are viewed, uh, from how women's rugby is viewed, because I do think that also plays very heavily into a lot of the disrespect that is given to women's rugby, and it's an annoying part of it. But for what it's worth, uh, they they did talk about, uh, again, all these other issues in women's rugby. I make the assumption that they didn't speak about the LGBTQ side, mainly because of the fact that it is such a stereotype for women's rugby. It, it almost seems like Victoria Rush was trying to like sidestep and avoid that, so to not, ironically, shuffle more feathers, ruffle more feathers than they probably could have and and not to create this overarching element that could overshadow these other components that also need help. But I, I did think that it was something important that needed to be talked about. Overall, I give the documentary a 7.5 out of 10. Um, again, I was well informed. I felt like I got to know the players a lot more. I really hope that I get a chance to interview Shauna Brown. And by hope, I mean I will interview Shauna Brown one of these days for the pod. Uh, and, and, of course, all these other people. But really, I want Shauna Brown because she was, she was dope in this. Uh, you guys can find it on Amazon Prime. Uh, definitely a good worth, uh, sitting down and taking a look and just, just enjoying what it has to offer. Just enjoying what it has to offer.